Therefore, it is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Last night's Global's Tom Hayes asked an important question for parents and teachers. He asked about violence in our schools and specifically what this government is going to do about it. Just look at some of the stories we heard. A Halton Region mother who recently moved from Durham said, my kids are now out in Halton Region, and guess what? The same problems exist here too. A teacher from Niagara said this, I quote, this seems like an epidemic in the Ontario school system all across the province. Clearly, the system is broken, Mr. Speaker. How long will parents have to worry about their children, and how long will teachers have to fear for their safety before this government finally acts? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know the Minister of Education will want to speak to the specifics, but I know, Mr. Speaker, having met with uh, representatives of our education partners, I know that we are working with them and that there is a, there's a particular request to work together to set up a, a process, Mr. Speaker, whereby we can ensure that there, there are the resources that are needed in our schools, um, particularly, uh, particularly on issues of, uh, of workplace safety, Mr. Speaker. And so that, that speaks to our commitment to uh, not just workplace safety for teachers and support workers, but also um, safety for everyone who, uh, who either goes to our schools, Mr. Speaker, parents who come into the school, and everyone who works in the school. We are working with our partners, and we we will ensure, Mr. Speaker, that we put uh, new supports in place if those are uh, if those are required. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. When there's violence in the classroom, the government has a duty and an obligation to act to protect the safety of our teachers. But of course, the Minister of Education passes the buck again and again. She leaves this epidemic up to the local school board, saying that it has nothing to do with the government. She tells everyone not to worry because local school boards have policies. But, Mr. Speaker, this is not a local issue. This is across the province. As the Niagara teacher told us, this is an Ontario-wide epidemic. What has to happen? What tragic event has to happen before the government realizes it's their responsibility and they can't pass the buck any longer? Mr. Speaker, how bad does this epidemic have to get until we can get a commitment from the province and from the Premier directly that they're going to take this issue seriously? Well, Mr. Speaker, you have that commitment. The people of Ontario have that commitment. Our education partners have that commitment. The parents in our schools and most importantly, Mr. Speaker, the students in our schools have that commitment. That's, ex that's exactly why we continue. We take responsibility. We continue to increase the resources in our schools, including, Mr. Speaker, the special education grant, which is projected to be uh, approximately $2.8 billion in 2017-18. And that grant is important, Mr. Speaker, because that is the grant that allows school boards to hire the support staff, to hire the uh, resources that they need in the classroom, Mr. Speaker. So we understand that there needs to be uh, a vigilant and ongoing discussion about what resources need to be in schools as, uh, as education evolves, Mr. Speaker, but we have, yes, we have inclusive schools in this province, Mr. Speaker. We continue to increase funding, and we are working with our partners to make sure Thank that you. the supports are in place. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and the Premier's position seems to be that everything's fine, the government's doing their job, and they'll continue to leave this to the local school boards. But the reality is everything isn't fine, it isn't rosy. The, the expose I'd, I'd encourage the, the Premier to watch and Tom Hayes' uh, interviews and highlighting the real challenges that students and teachers are facing. The reality is this is not the teacher's fault. We know teachers don't have the adequate support and training to deal with this violence in the classroom. We know this is an epidemic that has got atrociously bad. This is not an appropriate work environment for anyone. It's not acceptable. And I want the Premier, I want the government to understand they can't pass this off. And so my question, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier is this. Does the liability and responsibility for the safety of our teachers not belong to the Minister of Education, question. or are they going to again pass it off to the school board? Well, Mr. Speaker, let me be. Let me be clear once again. We understand that we are 
absolutely responsible for the supports that are, that are in our schools. We take this very seriously. And of course, Mr. Speaker, if there are uh, incidents of violence, then those are unacceptable for the, all of the people in a classroom or in a school, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly why, in my previous answer, I talked about the increased resources that we are putting in our schools. And we will continue to work with our education partners. As I said, I have met with representatives of uh, Teachers' Federation who have said to us that they think that as the classroom and the population evolves, as the, the classroom changes, Mr. Speaker, that we need to make sure that we have the resources and, and the training in place for everyone who works in our schools. We will work with our partners. The Minister of Education is Answer. doing that as we continue to increase funding in our schools. Both of those things go together, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Surprise, surprise, recent hydro bills across the province were stuffed with what appears to be partisan advertising. It appears like there's no line this Liberal government will not cross. So, Mr. Speaker, what I'd like to know specifically from the Premier is how much did this partisan Liberal advertising cost that you stuffed in hydro bills? Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Energy is going to want to speak to the supplementary, but let me just say that um, what, what is happening across the province is people are seeing their electricity bills go down, Mr. Speaker. They're seeing reductions uh, of their electricity bills. That's what our Fair Hydro Plan is about, Mr. Speaker. I understand that the Leader of the Opposition wants to talk about anything but uh, the fact that he doesn't have a plan and did not ever have a plan to reduce people's electricity bills. We are doing that. People are seeing those reductions on their bills, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly as it should be as people struggle to, to manage their finances on a day-to-day -day basis, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it's amazing that the Premier can defend this propaganda with a straight face. It's wrong. She knows it's wrong. The member for Prince Edward Hastings wrote to the Auditor-General about these Liberal ads stuffed in hydro bills. In her response, she essentially said this is not the first time the Liberals have used hydro bills for partisan purposes. They jammed election-style ads in hydro bills just before the 2011 election. Now we know the government has no shame. They will continue to cross lines to try to pitch this alternate reality of their farce of a hydro plan. As usual, the Liberals will do anything, anything to look out for the Liberal Party, not for ratepayers in Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask this. Member for Mancastle. When and where does a Liberal cross an ethical line? When do they realize that they, can, they have to stop using Ontario taxpayer resources to push their own partisan agenda. It's getting worse and worse. Question. If you're not going to listen to us, will you listen to the Auditor General and do the right thing? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the things that we continue to do as a government, Mr. Speaker, is bring forward a plan that will reduce rates by 25 per cent by July 1st, Mr. Speaker, of course, if this legislation passed. That's 25 per cent reduction for small businesses. That's 25 per cent reduction for farms, Mr. Speaker, and 25 per cent reduction for all families right across the province. When it comes to making sure that people in this province know that there's a plan out there, Mr. Speaker. It's this government that brought forward that plan. It's this government that is making sure that those 800,000 families in this province that live in the rural or northern part Brentford. actually will see a 40 to 50 percent reduction. What they also know, Mr. Speaker, is the opposition have no plan, and when they have no plan for electricity, Mr. Speaker, that just yes, means sir. they have no plan for Ontario. Your final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. Partisan false propaganda. That's what That's right. this is, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The Auditor General had this to say. She said the government's most recent advertising on its fair hydro plan would not have passed review. That's the Auditor General. Further, the Auditor General said they found that advertising to be misleading and self-congratulatory. Wow. It's not just the opposition. It's not just the media saying this hydro plan is a farce. It is the independent legislative oversight saying it's misleading wow. and self-congratulatory in terms of these ads. Clearly, the Liberals are abusing taxpayer money for their own partisan gain. That's not acceptable. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals pull their hydro election ads and stop campaigning on taxpayers' dime? It's a pretty simple Question. request. Will you simply do the right thing and stop abusing taxpayers for your own partisan gain?
you say it, please? Can you say it, please? Thank you. The member from Leeds, Grenville, second time. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know the PCs don't want the people of Ontario to know that there's going to be a 25 percent reduction coming by summer, Mr. Speaker. I know that the PCs don't want people to be able to plan and look at their, you know, their budgets, Mr. Speaker, and especially with the utilities. We have about 68 utilities in this province that they need to plan, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that they can inform their customers so they understand that. And I know they don't like telling people of Ontario what's actually happening, Mr. Speaker, because they have no plan when it comes to electricity. Mr. Speaker, they don't know. They have, you know, when it comes to their approach, Mr. Speaker, their approach doesn't lower bills for families. It doesn't lower bills for small businesses. It doesn't Duffer lower Caledon. bills for farms. It doesn't lower bills for long-term care homes. It doesn't cut Bruce bills for greenhouses, South. and it doesn't do anything to address Ontario's Indigenous communities, Mr. Speaker. And why is that? Because, Mr. Speaker, they have no plan. When they don't have a plan for electricity, they have no plan on what to do in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We have brought forward a plan that's going to reduce bills by 25 percent that will help Thank everyone you. in this province. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, in less than an hour, the Liberal government is going to force through a time allocation motion that severely limits debate on their hydro financing scheme, borrowing scheme, really, is what it is. And when that happens, this legislature will have had about seven hours of debate on this bill. Seven hours, Speaker, seven hours for legislation that will impact people's lives for the next 30 years. It's ludicrous. Why does this Premier insist upon ramming this legislation through the House? Mr. Speaker, I know that the, uh, the government House leader is going to want to speak to the procedural, um, these procedural mechanisms, but Mr. Speaker, I want to just make it clear that what we are doing is working to help people in their lives, whether it is the Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's OHIP plus Pharmacare, which will give all children across the province from zero to their 25th birthday free medication, Mr. Speaker. Those are, those are initiatives that we believe are critical. It is, it is outrageous to me, Mr. Speaker. Finish, please. It is uh, actually very surprising that the NDP is going to has indicated they will vote against both those measures, Mr. Sir. Speaker, and they they uh, would rather would rather focus on procedural mechanisms and games, Mr. Speaker, oh, than actually, actually deal with the substance. Supplementary. Speaker, what is outrageous is the plan that the Liberals are trying to ram through this legislature that will cost people more money in a couple years. Look, in addition to the limited debate that they're allowing here, they're also going to limit where the people of Ontario will have an opportunity to have their say. All of the public hearings that they've just had a change of heart on this morning uh, are going to be happening here in Toronto. Well, why won't the people in London be able to have their say, Speaker, or the people in Windsor or in Ottawa or in Thunder Bay or anywhere else outside of Toronto, Speaker? Why will those Ontarians not have a chance to have their say on this legislation? Thank you. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Well, Speaker, thank you very much. And uh, I can tell you on this side of the House, we are extremely proud to bring forward Bill 132. That is going to provide for immediate relief for all Ontarians by cutting their hydro bills by 25 per cent, Speaker. In fact, Speaker, the, the bill does not just stop there. For, for Ontarians who live in rural and northern communities, they will see a cut of 40 to 50 per cent on their hydro rates. It is Minister of Economic Development will come to order. Finish, please.
Speaker, it is a, a beyond comprehension is why the NDP is against giving Ontarians a significant relief from their hydro bills. Speaker, NDP say that they haven't had enough time to debate this bill, yet they announced their opposition to the, this yes, bill sir. within the first hour of introduction of this of this bill. Clearly, their minds are made up. They Thank don't want to. They don't want to help Ontarians. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, what the NDP is against is giving the people of Ontario the shaft on their hydro bills. That's what this government is about to do. This morning, this morning we did. We did call on this government to have a change of heart and to provide an opportunity for more public hearings. And of course, the Liberals said no, and then they had a sudden change of Minister heart. Minister of Municipal Speaker. Affairs. But not surprisingly, the government has decided to have all of the public hearings here in Toronto. That is not giving the people of Ontario a say, Speaker. That's giving some people an opportunity to have a stay, a say. So here we have an extremely important piece of legislation that's going to impact people's hydro bills in a very negative way in the short order. Question. And this government's not prepared to seek input from people across the province. Why? Thank you. Uh, I, I speak, uh, all the bluster we're seeing from NDP is because they really don't have a plan. What they put is an aspirational document that which someday, perhaps, maybe, if we are elected, Finish, please. Their, their plan is an aspirational plan. The, we, our plan is a real plan that is going to result in real cuts in hydro rates for people of Ontario. Speaker, speaker, the bill clearly says that that the cut will come into place after 15 days of, from receiving royal assent. Because we don't want to delay people of Ontario yes, getting a cut. Our government wants to have that 25 cut into, uh, cut into place right away, while Thank NDP you. just wants to debate the issue. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. In 2013, the Premier said this about her party's cancellation of the Oakville and Mississauga gas plants, and I quote, I never said this wasn't a political decision. It was Minister a political of Education. decision. Will the Premier admit Minister right now, Social so that her successor won't safety. have to, that her hydro borrowing scheme is just a political decision designed to try Minister to help her party hold on to power in the next election? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. I'm getting a sense somebody's requesting warnings. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our decision to reduce people's electricity bills by 25 percent has everything to do with people's ability to pay their electricity bills and to manage their budgets, Mr. Speaker. That's what, that's what our plan is about. And Mr. Speaker, we recognize that the $50 billion of investment that has been made in the electricity system to make it clean, renewable, and reliable, Mr. Speaker, investment that was necessary because uh, previous governments had not made those investments, Mr. Speaker, and we were dealing with a degraded electricity system in 2003, we recognize that the cost associated with that needs to be spread over a longer period of time. That's what we're doing, and in doing that, Mr. Speaker, we are able to give people immediate relief, 25 percent reduction this summer. And, Mr. Speaker, in rural and northern communities, some people will see Answer. a 40 to 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. That is in response to people's need in this province. That's what the Fair Hydro Plan is Thank about. Supplementary. Last fall, the Premier also admitted that soaring hydro bills were her mistake in the first place. She said, and I quote, I take responsibility as leader for not paying close enough attention to some of the daily stresses in Ontarians' lives. Electricity prices are a prime example. 
Why is the Premier pushing forward, Speaker, with a hydro borrowing scheme when documents know, documents show rather, and she knows that it will cause hydro bills to go up even further and cause even more stress for the families and businesses that she just apologized to six months ago? So, Mr. Speaker, uh, I've been very clear that uh, we were working on a number of initiatives. We removed 8 percent, Mr. Speaker, from people's bills. We renegotiated the Samsung uh, contracts, Mr. Speaker. We've been working on this not for months but for years to remove costs from the system because we recognized that those investments to upgrade the system were uh, costly and had a, a cost associated with them. In removing 25 percent from people's uh, bills, Mr. Speaker, we have said that that means that the cost will be shared over a longer period of time. And in the short term, that 25 per cent reduction sure. will help people immediately. In the midterm, Mr. Speaker, we will hold those bills down uh, uh, to the rate of inflation. And in the long term, the long term, long -term electricity plan, the long term energy plan is being developed, and we will continue to take costs out of the system. This is immediate relief, Mr. Speaker, but we recognize yes, that there is a longer term plan that's needed. That plan is being developed, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Final supplementary. Speaker, this Premier and this government are plagued by scandal. The Sudbury by-election bribery charges, the broken promise not to sell Hydro One, the gas plant decision, and now ramming an ill-thought-out hydro borrowing scheme through the House with no FAO assist, uh, assessment, with just six sitting days left and very, very little time for the people of Ontario to review it, and most importantly, when she knows it will end up costing people in this province more on their hydro bills. When will the Premier put an end to Liberal scandals and just admit she has no real plan to lower people's hydro bills, only another political decision? Thank you. Well, be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Premier. Well, oh, Mr. Speaker, people across this province are going to see a 25 percent reduction on average, between 23 and 28 percent reduction on average on their electricity bills by summer, Mr. Speaker. People in northern and rural communities, many will see up to a 40 to 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker. On January 1, 2018, children across this province will have access to free medication, Mr. Speaker. This fall, this September, students will be going to college without having to pay tuition kids from low income families will go I'll wait until you're finished when you thanks wave up finish Kids will be going to university, Mr. Speaker, and to college and taking training programs without having to pay tuition. My job yeah, as sir. Premier is to put in place plans that are real, that give people real relief, and that work and have real Thank timelines. You. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Start the clock. Start the clock. Be seated, please. Be seated. Minister of Children and Youth Services. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Later this morning, we'll be voting on the uh, government's budget measures bill. This includes giving the availability to municipalities to implement a new hotel tax. On this new tax, the Liberal MPP from Mississauga Streetsville stated, and I quote, this is a bad idea and I do not support it. He went on to say, and again I'm quoting, to attempt to tax out-of-town residents is taxation without representation. Even the Premier's own members have serious objections to this bill. I asked the Premier, is that why debate was cut off? Did the Premier not want the member from Mississauga Streetsville and others member from to Davenport. share these objections with the legislature? Thank you. Premier. Sir Finance. Sir Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, the member opposite was correct on one point. We are passing a bill this afternoon to pass the first balanced budget since the depths of the recession, Mr. Speaker. 
a balanced budget that's going to meet the needs of the people of Ontario, a budget that's going to support all our children under the age of 25 with free medication, a budget that's going to provide supports for education and health care with record investments, a budget that's going to provide for more roads and bridges and public transit, Mr. Speaker. And mess, Mr. Speaker, we are going to provide the City of Toronto and other municipalities with more powers at their request. But, Mr. Speaker, what's important here is that we're providing for the people of Ontario, and that member opposite should be supporting that as well. Thank you. Supplementary. The member from Oxford. Much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is back to the Premier. Premier, the member from Mississauga Streetsville isn't the only one of your members that disagrees with your policies. The Liberal member from Beach Beaches East York said, quote, the rent controls that we, we brought that were brought in by the previous NDP government under Bob Ray decimated the affordable mar housing market in Toronto and other communities in Ontario because it didn't allow the private sector to continue to build. He went on to say, quote, I would resist tremendously any amendment to this legislation that would bring back rent Minister control. Of housing. Premier, did you cut off debate on Bill 24? So that your members couldn't raise these objections in the legislature. Thank you. Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite has just made reference. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. The member from Beaches East York, come to order. Minister. The member of his office just made reference to 16 measures, comprehensive measures, to try to cool the market, to address demand and supply in our housing sector, to provide and support the people of Ontario and homeowners who are trying to get into the market. The member opposite is suggesting otherwise. Again, they're voting against the people of Ontario. They're not supporting the very families that are trying to get into the marketplace as we've addressed in those measures going forward, Mr. Speaker. I asked the member opposite and the first question, what will they cut as we proceed forward in these measures, Mr. Speaker? Will they cut farm and care for the, for the children of our communities? Will they cut hospitals and education and schools in their respective communities, Mr. Speaker? That's what they're voting for. They're voting against the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Premier. Families in Brampton know that their hospital is dangerously overcrowded. The emergency room sees about 160 per cent more people each and every day than they were designed to care for. People like Jamie Lee Ball have suffered on, for days on end on stretchers in hallways, and 87-year-old Rafina Delrop passed away after spending five long days in the hallways of the ER. The Premier could do something to fix the overcrowding at Brenton Civic, but she refuses to act. How much longer do the good people of Brampton have to wait before this Premier actually does something to fix the overcrowding at the Brenton Civic Hospital? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the people of Ontario don't have to wait much longer at all. In fact, just a few short minutes from now, we'll be voting on a budget, which I hope the member opposite will support, that contains more than $500 million of new investment added to the base of hospitals across this province. Every single hospital will get a minimum of a 2 percent increase to their budget. And in addition to that, we have reserved significant funds specifically for hospitals like the Brampton Civic. And Mr. Speaker, we're adding an additional $10 million to the Brampton Civic this year, subject to the approval of the budget, which I hope the member opposite and her party will support for that very reason. And I have to remind Ontarians as well how proud I was to be standing beside the Premier just a few short weeks ago when we opened the brand new Peel Memorial Answer. Health Set Wellness Centre, which is providing extraordinary service to the people of Brampton, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Premier was at Osler Health this morning, and she could have announced that her government will stop the overcrowding at Brampton Hospital, but she failed to do that. Brampton Civic needs at least 200 more beds in the short term and more like 600 more beds in the long term. The Premier's failures to step up and fix the overcrowding crisis means that patients like Jamie Lee 
and Rofina will continue to suffer from hallway medicine. People will continue to wait for days in hallways without a proper hospital bed and hospital care. Why does the Premier think that hallway medicine is good enough for the people of Brampton? Well, of course, that's an unfair characterization of the position of this party, Mr. Speaker, but that's precisely why we invested approximately half a billion new dollars last year, an additional more than $500 million this year in this budget, and in just a few minutes, the member opposite has the opportunity to support those investments, Mr. Speaker, and those investments include a multi-billion dollar investment in a brand new hospital that will benefit Mississauga and Etobicoke, the Trillium the new hospital in Mississauga of the Trillium Network, Mr. Speaker, and it's part of capital investments of $20 billion over the next 10 years for new hospitals, for redevelopments, for expansions, precisely, I would hope, precisely to address the kind of issue that the member opposite has raised today. Sir, thank you. New question, the member from Republic of Lakeford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Uh, last fall, our government undertook to fix the Ontario Municipal Board and Land Use Planning System. Mr. Speaker, the government held a series of town halls and stakeholder meetings across the province to hear from Ontarians directly, and I held two town halls in my own riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore. Speaker, I can tell you from listening to my own constituents' concerns and from my 17 years' experience on City Council, the status quo is not working. Substantial changes to the land use planning system need to put people and communities first. And I was extremely pleased to hear the news that our government is taking action to overhaul the province's land use planning appeal system. More importantly, giving communities a stronger voice and ensuring people have access to faster, fairer, and more affordable hearings. Can the Attorney General tell us how community consultations helped inform the government's proposed actions? Thank you. Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I do want to truly, uh, really thank the member from Etobicoke Lecture Fuss for his, uh, his guidance uh, to both myself and to the Minister of Municipal Affairs on this very important issue. Being a planner himself, having served on the city, uh, Toronto uh, City Council, of course, he brought forward a lot of practical experience that was very helpful to us. So thanks to the member for his hard work on behalf of his community and advice to us. Speaker, we did some extensive consultation on, on this issue, as you, as you know. Uh, we held town halls with over 700 attendees from Windsor to Ottawa. Virtually every sector we heard from had ideas for improving the Ontario Municipal Board or the OMB um, and the hearing process. At the end of the day, Speaker, people want more community involvement and more local control over planning decisions. Speaker, in coming weeks, we will introduce legislation to transform Ontario's land use planning appeal yes, system, including uh, creating the local planning appeal tribunal, which would, if passed, replace the Ontario Thank Municipal you. Board and eliminating land and cost hearings. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Attorney General for his answer. I'm very proud today that our government is committed to giving communities here, here. a stronger voice and create a more level playing field. I know my constituents are extremely pleased uh, by this commitment to overhaul the planning system. Mr. Speaker, the chief planner of the City of Toronto, Jennifer Keysmat, has called our government's reforms a generational change. Here, here. Toronto City Councillor uh, Josh Matlow has said, Government should be commended for finally tipping the balance of power away from developers and towards residents and municipal governments. This is how we plan communities. Speaker, the government is committed as part of its proposed legislation to establish a support centre to help citizens participate in the tribunal process. Question. Could the Attorney General tell us more about the local planning appeal support centre? Thank you, Attorney General. Speaker, as I was, I was uh, saying, uh, we will be creating a local planning appeal tribunal that will rep uh, replace the OMB. We also will be eliminating lengthy and costly de novo, uh, de novo hearings, and we'll be establishing an independent support centre uh, called the local planning appeal support center to provide free legal support for citizens participating in the tribunal processes this will spe uh, speak uh, uh, speaker will support more clear and more timely decision making 
In the end of the day, Speaker, the result is going to be fewer, shorter, less costly hearings and more efficient decision-making process, giving communities a stronger voice and fostering a more level playing field. That is why, Speaker, mayors across yes, this sir. province, residents across this province are supporting our, our, our proposal. Uh, it's been uh, described as a bold step that the province is taking. Speaker, I'm hoping uh, that we'll bring this legislation Thank and you. that will be approved by this legislature. Thank you. No question. The member from Simcoe Gray. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Uh, speaker, in February of uh, 2015, my private member's resolution concerning service clubs received all party support in this House. It called on the government to strike a committee to investigate the legislative and regulatory barriers and burdens facing service clubs, such as the costs of audits, red tape when applying for lottery and liquor licenses, increased regulations and taxes and fees, to name just a few. The government sent my request to the Standing Committee on Social Policy for a mere one-half day of hearings. The committee issued a summary of recommendations, and since then we have heard nothing despite my repeated requests for action on the issues raised by the service clubs. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. What has the government done to remove the regulatory barriers facing service clubs in all our communities? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for the question. I think we all agree that service clubs play a very important role in our communities, and I, I congratulate the member for bringing uh, the bill forward. And our government is very committed to looking at reducing regulatory burdens, red tape that affect affect the. Uh, the, the, the member role that Perth groups like this Wellington. play in our community. So I haven't heard from the member on this uh, recently, so I'd be pleased to discuss with him um, the next steps. And, uh, I, and uh, I, as I say, am a strong advocate for uh, making uh, things easier, especially our not-for-profit sector speaker. Uh, the member will know that the not-for-profit corporation has received royal assent, and these uh, kinds of files are very Answer. important to me and to our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. The Rotary Club of Bracebridge has told me this government's ridiculous rules are creating unnecessary obstacles to fundraising. The Rotary Club of Bracebridge raises money for local events and causes and to support local families in need. Every year, they raffle off a car. This year, they added a duck race, but they are unable to get a license to start selling raffle tickets for the car until the duck race is over. That means they will lose two months of, uh, of time for selling the raffle tickets for the car. Speaker, the committee heard about these issues more than six months ago. As life gets harder in Ontario under this government, communities and families rely more and more on service clubs for help. Speaker, why has the minister not made the recommended changes to help these volunteers who are trying to raise money for such worthy clubs? Question. Thank you. Minister. Minister of Finance. Sure, Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The members opposite are highlighting a very important point. All of us are concerned about our our, uh, our service clubs to do the job they need in raising money and providing for gaming and bingo as well. And it's something that I'm working on with the OLG and the AGCO to determine how best to provide those services and enable them to have more accommodations. I know working with some of the cities is also part of uh, the issue where they have the, re the wherewithal to advance some of those causes. But Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the concerns. We share them with you. We want to make it easier for our service clubs to provide the service that they do so essentially in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. New question, a member from Timiskaming, Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, we learned that a brokerage in Hong Kong is advertising condo units with a promise to pay the non-resident speculation tax on the investor's behalf. This completely defers, defeats the purpose of the tax, but the Minister of Finance says it's fine because the government is still getting paid. Is the Premier interested in cracking down on speculation and keeping homes affordable, or, like her minister said, is she only interested in filling government coffers? Mr. Speaker, let's, let's, make, let's make no mistake. There's no loophole here. Um, there, if, should this legislation pass, by the way, then there will be a 50% speculation tax that will be applied to all non-resident Canadian buyers who provide and purchase residential homes in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, Mr. Speaker. And 
no matter how it's being advertised by some independent, all-in price, by some other agency in another part of the world, uh, outside of Canada, the buyers will be paying the tax if they're a non-resident Canadian, and that's just the point that we're making, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Again to the Premier. A media report over the weekend revealed that the Premier avoided taking action against housing speculation, even as Toronto home prices skyrocketed by over 33 percent in just one year. The article said, quote, Premier Kathleen Wynne and Mr. Souza told government officials that they needed the approval of the major banks to pursue the speculation tax. Unquote. Is the Premier unwilling to stop speculation and make homes affordable because she cares more about her banker friends than Ontario families who need un affordable homes? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, there's a 16-point measure in this. Uh, in our fair housing plan. Uh, we hope the members opposite will support them. They include rent controls, Mr. Speaker. They include protections for tenants. They also include protections to provide for more supply into the mix. And they apply a, a non-resident Canadian speculation tax on those that do not live in Canada and are crowding out families that are trying to buy homes. Mr. Speaker, we're supporting and we're providing for this. And I hope the members opposite will support the very thing for the very same practice and measures that we're putting out. Mr. Speaker, it's important to cool the market and enable our families and young people to get into the market if they wish. The members opposite, I believe, I believe they support that, but I'm not really certain at this point, Mr. Speaker, what they're getting at. Thank you. Your question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, like the member from Utopical Lakeshore, um, I too held a consultation town hall on OMB review with the member from Davenport. Wow. The Ontario Municipal Board is an independent adjudicative tribunal. When people disagree over how the community should grow, often OMB hears the case and makes a decision. These are important decisions, and Ontario we build today will determine how we live, work, and play tomorrow. We want a healthy, a sustainable, livable community. Many of my constituents have expressed concern that the OMB doesn't always give enough weight to the local perspective when it makes a decision. Yesterday, the minister, along with the Attorney General, announced that our government is taking action to improve our land use planning appeal system. Would the minister Question. elaborate on some of the changes our government is proposing? Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question. In the coming weeks, Speaker, legislation will be introduced that, if passed, would create the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal to replace the Ontario Municipal Board. The new tribunal would be mandated to give greater deference to the decisions of local communities. Now, the member for Trinity Spadina was one of many of our members, I would say, who held their own town halls and listened to what their constituents had to say, in addition to the consultations, at least a dozen or so, held by our ministry. The feedback came back to us and was considered as a part of the review. We heard that people wanted more community involvement, a more meaningful voice in the process, more local control over planning decisions, fewer hearings, and a more transparent process. Speaker, that's what we're proposing. This process, if passed, will provide more certainty for all including those in the development industry. Speaker, in the supplementary, Answer. I'm going to give some details on how we're providing more deference to local decision-making in this legislative thank package. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the minister for the answer. I understand that as uh, providing more deference to local decision-making, our government is proposing that a few cases to go to appeal body, and some local decisions are exempt from, it, the, uh, from appeal. In my writing, the Austin Community Association had questions about how community would grow near transit areas. All Ontarians should be able to count on a land use planning and appeal system that is efficient, transparent, and predictable, and one that gives residents a say in what's built in their neighbourhood. Yeah. Speaker, through you to the Minister. Would the Minister explain how seeing a few municipal and provincial decisions go to tribunal will benefit communities in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the member, and he, he is uh, he's spot on, Speaker. We're proposing to bring fewer municipal decisions before the tribunal. New official plans, major OP updates, and detailed plans to support growth in major transit station areas would be sheltered from appeal. 
On the transit piece, we're proposing a tool that would put greater power in the hands of municipalities. When municipalities plan for transit, support of densities around a major transit station in a way that reflects community concerns and circumstances, Speaker, we believe that planning should be protected at the discretion of the municipality. That's what we're proposing. All these changes would support the development of more livable, accessible, and complete neighbourhoods. We've heard that too often OMB decisions don't consider local perspectives. These changes, Speaker, will reset the balance. That's why local governments are supporting this announcement. We've heard from a number of mayors right across the GTHA and beyond who are very supportive of this, Speaker. Thank it's you. a great piece. We're proud of it, and we think it's landed. Thank you. New question, the member from Lorna, Front Athletics and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, throughout April and May, I received hundreds and hundreds of letters from my constituents expressing outrage over their hydro bill and the excessive cost of electricity on their families and their homes and businesses. Every single one of these letters is addressed to the Premier and is, has a hydro bill attached to it. Speaker, my constituents blame the Premier for her interference, her meddling, and ideological pursuits, which have resulted in this hydro scandal. I'm going to send these letters over to the Premier with the page. These people deserve an honest answer and response from the, the architect of this anarchy. Speaker, will the Premier be straight with my constituents in Question. response? Or will they have to continue to rely on leaked cabinet documents instead? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate, I appreciate the, uh, the uh, correspondence that the member has sent, and we certainly will uh, will look at it and uh, and respond, Mr. Speaker. And I assume that these letters have come into uh, my office. I'll have to look at them, uh, Mr. Speaker. But you know what I will say to each one of them is that we recognize that electricity costs needed to be dealt with. We recognize that making sure that we had a reliable, clean electricity grid had a cost associated with, with it, Mr. Speaker, and we recognize that it is very important that we take 25 per cent off their bills by summer, Mr. Speaker, so that they will have an easier time managing their Bruce household budget. So I will be absolutely Second straight with time. you, Mr. Speaker, and I will further say that the way we are doing that is we are asking the people of Ontario over a longer period of time to pay for those upgrades of the electricity yes, system sir. and even the playing field, Mr. Speaker, yeah. and I will absolutely be Thank happy you. to say that to your Speaker, again to the Premier, I, I asked for a straightforward and honest response because I've read that confidential uh, cabinet document on the global adjustment smoothing, as well as so many others have. And it states after this year, we can expect rates to continue to rise and in 10 years' time, 50 per cent higher. Everybody sees this as a sleight of hand, Speaker, and crass actual electioneering tactic to try to refloat their foundering political ship. Speaker, the Premier needs to explain and be truthful to the people of Ontario that what this government says in this House and to the media appears to be very different than what is being said behind those very secretive cabinet doors. And I believe all those suffering Question. in energy poverty deserve the truth. Does the Premier believe they deserve the truth? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And talking about being truthful, Mr. Speaker, let's be truthful about those bills. Those are Hydro One bills, Mr. Speaker. Hydro One, R1, and R2 customers. They will see 40 to 50 percent off on those bills, Mr. Speaker. I hope that that member will be honest with them and let them know that he and his party are voting against that. 40 to 50 percent, and you're voting against that. Seniors in your riding, you're voting against those who have no. To the chair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I apologize for that. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I hope that the member is telling the constituents in his riding that they are getting a 40 to 50 percent reduction that he's voting against. I hope that he's telling the constituents in his riding that they have no plan, that they have no idea on what to do. The only thing that they can do, Mr. Speaker, is send us.
member from the PN Carleton will come to order. New question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. My uh, question is to the Premier. Premier, it's pretty clear watching our federal government and their negotiations on the softwood lumber uh, situation that they're almost ready to throw in the towel for Ontario. The minister is on the minister, the federal minister of the Crown has actually stated at this point they're going to focus on the job losses, that they know there's going to be job losses in the Ontario industry and that they're prepared to do something in order to offset those job losses. Madam Premier, there doesn't have to be one job lost in Ontario. Our industry is not subsidized. It's been found like that under Chapter 19 of NAFTA not once but numerous times by the uh, Chapter 19 to say that, in fact, we don't subsidize our interest, industry. So my question to you is this. Will you stand up for Ontario and make sure that if the federal government comes up short when it comes to the Ontario industry, that we are there in order to deal and with sir, the immediacy our question, sir. of making sure that they've got the money to survive the next three years until we get another positive ruling? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And uh, we on this side of the House are also very concerned about the softwood lumber dispute, and we've taken very strong action. Ontario is working with this sector to protect this important part of Ontario's economy and minimize the impact of these unreasonable duties. We've called on the federal government to create a loan guarantee program to protect forest companies here in Ontario. We're also providing $74 million in funding to the forest industry to reimburse costs for their forest and public access roads, which will help to connect not only remote communities but also keep those workers going. We've been continuing to work at the, uh, the uh, federal government task force with my provincial um, colleagues as well to uh, call answer. on other measures too, and I can address more of those in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, those are not roads for forest companies. Those are roads for the public. Of course we subsidize them because they're for cottagers. They're for anybody going into the bush to do whatever. So don't go down that line. The issue is we have an industry that we don't subsidize. We have an industry that has been found in chapter— Stop the clock. Minister of Municipal Affairs, second time. And address the chair, please. Speaker, to the Premier, we have an industry that is not subsidized, that has been found so. What I'm asking this government to do is that if the federal government comes up short, which it appears that they will, that Ontario will do what Quebec did and make sure that we have a fund in place in order to protect our industry for the three years that it's going to take to come to yet win another decision under Chapter 19. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for the supplementary. And we, on this side of the border, are taking uh, action. We are looking at all options on Ontario. We continue to bring the Ontario voice to the federal government, who are responsible for going out and. Uh, and negotiating. We have named Jim Peterson, who was a former federal trade minister, as our emissary, and he's working on behalf of our workers. I wanted to point out to the member opposite that they downloaded those forest roads to the municipalities. Not only are we supporting of those, we top that up with $20 million more million that keeps those members and those contractors working from those forest companies in order to maintain and build those roads. Kevin Edgson, CEO of Ecom, which runs a sawmill, added that the uh, announcement of that uh, extra money demonstrates the Ontario government's support for strong, Answer. safe, reliable infrastructure in north of, uh, northern Ontario. We continue to look at all options as this rolls out. Thank you. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mm. Minister, we always hear about how well our economy is doing. We've been leading the G7 in growth for three years, and now we have the lowest unemployment rate in Ontario has seen in the last 16 years. Here, here. But, the, but the economy is changing. Many people are anxious about their futures and the futures of their children. But, Minister, are the future generations of this province prepared for these changes, and what are we doing to support them? Good question. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Speak, it's so nice to get a question. Yay. I'm really happy to be able to get up on my feet. I'm almost out of practice. At, at a time when our economies all over the world are struggling to achieve strong economic growth, Ontario's economy is consistently outperforming its peers. This week, I and the Minister of uh, 
Research, Innovation and Science had the pleasure of visiting Discovery 2017 uh, just down the street, Mr. Speaker, and we were absolutely astounded at what we saw there. Discovery is one way this province is building the culture of, of a, a culture of entrepreneurialism among our young people. At the Young Entrepreneurs Make Your Pitch competition, I have to tell you, I met so many impressive high school students who were providing innovative, practical solutions to everyday problems. Their ideas range from financial literacy apps for students uh, to innovative ways to grow blueberries uh, to a communications device yes, to keep seniors, seniors connected uh, to their doctors. Mr. Speaker, I have to tell you, when we see those young people at Discovery, when we see those young entrepreneurs, it gives us every confidence in our future. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. Technology is advancing in an unprecedented, unprecedented rate in Ontario. That's right. I'm happy to see that this government puts the hard work and advocacy to, forward to make sure Ontario's scientists and researchers are supported in every capacity. Here, here. Every morning I wake up and read more and more articles about new, exciting companies opening up offices in Ontario to attract workers from our highly skilled talent pool. I understand that over the past two days, several ministers have been attending the Ontario Centres of Excellence Discovery 2017 conference and spoke on on the direction of innovation in Ontario. Question. Could the minister please tell the members of this legislature what was presented at Discovery and the work our government has been doing Thank to you. support innovation in minister. Ontario? The Minister of uh, Research, Innovation and Science, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Innovation, Research and Science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Barry for, for that question. Mr. Speaker, I had the pleasure of addressing over 3,000 of Ontario's wow, innovators and finest entrepreneurs alongside people like Madame Gina uh, McCarthy, former head of the US EPA under President Obama. Wow. I was able to see our recent $50 million investments in artificial intelligence through the Vector Institute in Toronto coming to life before my eyes. Mr. Speaker, a large feature of discovery this year was a new and the exciting suite of transformative technologies consisting of 5G networks, quantum technologies, cybersecurity, and autonomous vehicles. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to seeing these technologies flourish and laying the foundation for transformative economy in our province of Ontario. Thank you, sir. Thank you. No question. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, I'm sure the Minister of Transportation was as surprised as I was when the 2017-2018 budget was tabled and there was not a single mention of the continued expansion of Highway 417 in Renfrew County. Wow. Municipal officials and my constituents were equally disappointed. This is a vital transportation corridor which is not only of great importance to the economic success of Renfrew County, it is also part of the Trans-Canada Highway System. Speaker, will the minister explain why this most important link did not receive any priority in the government's recent budget, and can we expect him to ensure that it will be that mistake will be rectified in the next five-year infrastructure plan? Good question. Thank you, Minister of Transportation. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I, I do want to begin by thanking the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, for his question. I've said before in this House. In response to a very similar question from that member on this exact same topic, Speaker, uh, that I certainly do respect the advocacy that he brings to the discussion around this important Carol, infrastructure we'll project money. for his community. And in fact, Speaker, I will say, as I said a number of weeks or months ago, to that member, I do appreciate the work that he's done locally, including inviting me out to speak with municipal representatives from his community and others, uh, including from our, our military, our military base uh, in that part of. Uh, in that part of Ontario. What I said that day when I went to that community speaker was that I recognize as Minister of Transportation that we have a critical need to make sure that we continue to invest in all of the highway projects that are deserving of the investment in every corner of the province of Ontario. And in fact, Speaker, it's what our government's doing. In this year's budget, there uh, is nearly $3 billion set aside to invest in capital highway expansions and improvements, Speaker. And I'd be quite happy to provide additional information on the follow-up question that I know that member is going to ask. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the minister's kind words. What I'd really like to hear is the roar of diesel engines and bulldozers and tandem trucks. The minister will recall his visit to Renfrew County last year, 
I know his visit was help the visit was helpful to the minister and was most appreciated by the municipal officials and others in attendance. The minister conceded that a compelling case for continued expansion, expansion of Highway 417 has certainly been made. The requirement to show that the project is vital and worthy of the minister's support has been made. Not having it in the recent budget was, again, I say, a disappointment. Speaker, will the minister please correct this glaring omission in the 2017-2018 budget and commit to putting the expansion of 417 into his ministry's next five-year infrastructure plan. Question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. So again, I'll thank the member for the follow-up question. It's very clear, I think, to everyone here in this chamber that he brings a lot of passion to the advocacy for this particular issue, Speaker, and it's certainly something that I, uh, I certainly appreciate, Speaker. You know. Uh, th this member has said what he hopes to hear is that we're going to be uh, investing in highways in every corner of Ontario, including in his community, because he wants to hear the sound, the roar, I think he put it as a speaker, of the machines that are building roads and highways and bridges, again, in every corner of Ontario. Speaker, that's why year after year, for the nearly five years that I've served here as an MPP, we have consistently invested unprecedented amounts of money in highway infrastructure wow. in every corner of Ontario, including in eastern Ontario. Speaker, this year alone in the budget, we are investing not only billions of dollars specifically for highways, but overall $190 billion over the next, I believe it's 12 or 13 years, Speaker. An additional amount, an additional amount that we're putting into this because we understand for a couple of reasons we need to have the infrastructure for the future of our economy and for the quality of life for the people that we're proud to represent, Speaker. Thank you. And we also want to continue. New question, member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, your government has consistently bragged in this House over what you claim to have done for people when it comes to auto insurance rates. Yet a report produced by David Marshall said that our auto insurance rates are, quote, almost 55 percent higher than the Canadian average. David Marshall's report also highlighted that despite our province having the lowest level of auto accidents and despite residents losing coverage under this Liberal government, we are paying by far the highest auto insurance rates in Canada. Before the last election, this government campaigned on reducing auto insurance rates by 15 per cent and then said it was a stretch goal. Is the Premier proud of this record, and will she admit her auto insurance policies have made life harder for people trying to get by? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for the question, and, and I thank David Marshall, Mr. Speaker, for the work that he's done that we've commissioned in enabling us to provide even further measures to reduce auto insurance rates. Mr. Marshall was correct, and we've been saying it from the beginning. We are having tremendously high costs of insurance in this province, and that creates higher premiums. So we have taken steps to reduce those costs over that period of time, and rates have come down on average by almost 8%. We also want to further reduce them to more than 15%. In fact, there are many companies that have already reduced their rates by 15% and more. Mr. Marshall's work is critical. It's out there for public uh, uh, content and for public discussion in furthering supporting victims directly as opposed to those that are providing greater costs within the system. You're right. Answer. In Alberta and other jurisdictions, the cost of these claims are much higher, are much lower, I should say, and we got to get ours lower too. I hope you'll you. support those initiatives as well. Today, we have in the Speaker's Gallery a student delegation that uh, we believe will be the future political leaders of the United States. They are from the Maggie L. Walker Governor School for Government and International Studies from Richmond, Virginia. Welcome. I will be meeting with them immediately after question period, and I'm sure they're going to ask me about what they just saw. I beg to inform the House that following the report was tabled. The report of the Integrity Commissioner of Ontario concerning the review of all, uh, uh, allowable expenses under the Cabinet Minister's and Opposition Leaders' Expense Review and Accountability Act 2002, Section 14B, received in January 2017, submitted submission completed of May 15, 2017. 
I also beg to inform the House that the following report was also tabled. The report on the Integrity Commissioner of Ontario concerning the review of, of allowable expenses under the Cabinet Minister's and Opposition Leader's Expense Review and Accountability Act 2002, Section 14B, received in February 2017, submitted com co submission completed as of May 15, 2017. We have a deferred vote on the Government Notice of Motion 30 relating to allocation of time of Bill 132, an act to enact the Fair Hydro the Ontario Fair Hydro Plan Act 2017, an act to amend and amendments to Electricity Act 1998 and the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
All members, please take your seats. All members. On May 16, 2017, Mr. Ballard moved co uh, government notice of motion number 30 relating to allocation of time on Bill 132. All those in favour, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack, Mr. Nack, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Del Duca, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Sandals, Mr. Sousa, Mr. Sousa, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, Ms. Matthews, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Dugan, Mr. Dugan, Mr. McCharles, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. McMeekin, Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Bardinetti, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Dillon, Mr. Murray, Mr. Murray, Mr. Chan, Mr. Chan, Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi, Mr. Coteau, Mr. Coteau, Ms. Hunter, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Leal, Mr. Leal, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Flynn, Mr. Thibault, Mr. Thibault, Madame Lalonde, Madame Lalonde, Mr. Cadre, Mr. Cadre, Mr. Dixon, Mr. Dixon, Mrs. Mangas, Mrs. Mangas, Mr. Crack, Mr. Crack, Ms. Domino, Ms. Domino, Mrs. McGarry, Mrs. McGarry, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Morrow, Ms. Jassy, Mr. Jassy, Mr. Zimmer, Mr. Zimmer, Mrs. Albanese, Mr. Albanese, Mrs. McMahon, Mr. McMahon, Mr. Ballard, Mr. Ballard, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Naidu Harris, Ms. Wong, Ms. Wong, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, Mr. Dong, Mr. Dong, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Koala, Ms. Koala, Ms. Molly, Ms. Molly, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mr. Milch, Mr. Milch, Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise. One more time, we recognize the other court. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sal Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sal Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Van Toff. Mr. Van Toff. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 53, the nays are 44. The ayes being 53 and the nays being 44, I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred vote on the government notice of motion number 29 relating to the allocation. Same vote? Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 53, the nays are 44. The ayes being 53 and the nays being 44, I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 127, an act to implement budget measures to enact, amend, and repeal various statutes. Same vote? No. Call in the members. This will be a five minute bell. Today, Mr. Duguid moved third reading of Bill 127, an act to implement budget measures and to enact, amend, and repeal various statutes. All those in favor, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Nathan. Mr. Nathan. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. 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 Mr.
Choteau. Mr. Choteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerle. Ms. Domerle. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mrs. Wong. Mrs. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to recognize the report. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostaf. Mr. Ostaf. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettit. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Shubisong. Ms. Shubisong. Mr. Shubisong. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Shamanta. Mr. Shamanta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 53, the nays are 44. The ayes be 53 and the nays being 44, declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. On a point of order. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to move a motion without notice regarding the Standing Committee on Justice Policies consideration of Bill 132, an act to enact the Ontario Free Hydro Act Plan Act 2017. Government House, do you seek unanimous consent put forward a motion without notice? Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. Government House. Speaker, I move that notwithstanding the order of the House just passed, that the Standing Committee on Justice Policy also be authorized to meet on Tuesday, May 23, 2017, and Thursday, May 25, 2017, from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, and from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m., for the purpose of public hearings on Bill 132, and that the Clerk of the Subcommittee shall provide to the Subcommittee a list of the requests to appear received by 10 a.m. on Friday, May 19, 2017, and then and the members of the subcommittee or their designates shall prioritize and return the list to clerk of the committee by 11 a.m. on Friday, May 19, 2017, and that the clerk of the committee shall schedule witnesses based on these prioritized lists, and that the clerk of the committee, in consultation with the committee chair, be authorized to repeat this process as necessary to facilitate scheduling witness, and that the deadline for request to appear be 4 p.m. on Wednesday, May 24, 2017, and that the deadline for written submission be 5 p.m. on Thursday, May 25, 2017, and the deadline for amendments be 6 p.m. on Thursday, May 25, 2017. Thanks, Rishi. Mr. Nakvi moves that notwithstanding the order of dispense, we agree? Agreed. Agreed. Carried. There being no there being no deferred vote, no further deferred votes, this House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>